please? And stop talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so if everybody can come on in and uh, if we close those doors, please. That's right. We don't want to let anybody get out of here. <laughs> right. So, again, welcome to First Baptist Church. And as always, uh, you're not here by accident. God brought you here either to be blessed or to be a blessing, hopefully both. Uh, ladies T, wow. <laughs> I don't know. Was anybody going to say anything about that this morning or no? Okay, here we go. You're still eating. I, I don't know what the last count was, but we had a proximity of 110, 100. I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so beautiful day. Jennifer was an awesome speaker. Um, I don't know if she spoke to you ladies' hearts, but she sure spoke to mine. Um, I just want to say thank you to Kathy and Becky, all of the people who hosted a table. It was a beautiful day, and it was just a great bonding moment for us sisters. And, well, thank you. and the men for helping us. There were a lot of men that backed us up and helped. So thank you, guys. Okay, I guess we, we could probably help next year, too. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, there we go. Upcoming events. So CR, uh, Celebrate Recovery, is back on. Yeah. So Friday nights. <laughs> Six, 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 right, but it's usually <laughs> 630. Okay, so this one, I think you guys are having a, what, barbecue? You're going to be having some steaks and filet mignon. Filet mignon. <laughs> All right, well, if you're just coming for that, then you probably need, do need to come, so, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so BBS meeting uh, is going to be Sunday at... Saturday. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Saturday. Did you? Oh, yeah. Did you have something to say about that, young lady? Well, hang on. Hang on. I don't think they can hear you. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yolanda's going to call everyone this week to remind everyone, too. Um, but also, if you're not a leader in Team Kids, your uh, time at the meeting is going to be real short. Just a few announcements. If you are a leader, or um, a teacher, it's going to be a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Wait, it's going to be five hours. I hope you're providing lunch. <laughs> okay, I'll, so we got the uh, clothing, uh, our neighbors uh, coming up at the first of the month. Uh, in fact, I think it's going to be on the first. Yep. 8.30. Uh, is, is Jerry here? Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I know, I saw her. So, so yeah, uh, if you have not been able to help and you would like to help, uh, we'd like you to be here by about 8 o'clock and uh, really just to help folks find clothes, to restock, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, if you want to get involved with a very easy ministry, very easy, but it means a lot, uh, be there Saturday morning. I'm just, yeah, Saturday morning on the 1st. Uh, and help us out with that. And uh, I don't think we need any more clothes. So pass that out to your friends, too, because it kind of starts getting piled up back there. And uh, well, I, I'm, I'm complaining. Until after the clothing. Yeah, till, yeah, till after the clothing giveaway. Then you can bring it. OK, um, so we've got a council meeting coming up on the second also. Uh, and then. Um, Men's breakfast. Okay, so we missed men's breakfast this last time because we deferred to the ladies Thank for their... You well, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, Dave is and uh, Tall Tony are heading that up. I guess we're... So we're going to be uh, meeting in June for that. Um, so Father's Day is coming up. Uh, anybody who has a father that would need a... If you don't have a father and you'd like to give a gift to a father, uh, I am a father. <laughs> so if you would like to do that, 
Keep it under 100 if you can. Um, and of course, we're going to have our, our uh, kids camp coming up. So uh, your camp, right now we've got about, uh, we've got right around 20 kids and uh, we're still looking for uh, sponsors and folks to donate if they could. Uh, see me or if you're making a check out to, uh, to help out with that, just make it out to the Benevolence Fund. Actually, make it out to First Baptist Church and then on that little line down there, put uh, camp. I'm sorry, what? Okay, thank you, Yoli. Okay, so, well, no, that, that was it. Okay, thanks. Um, so we're, we're still giving to the Annie Armstrong until the end of the month. In fact, I believe we've got this Sunday and next Sunday. I believe those are the last two days to give. And there is a, we still have the uh, envelopes uh, and this, this goes to our, thank you, yeah, this goes to our North American mission partners uh, for the Southern Baptist, and so uh, what you give for that goes above and beyond what we normally give, and that goes directly to those missionaries to help them with, you know, finances and uh, things that they may incur while they're there, just to bless them, so uh, I believe uh, last count, uh, Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> right there. 17, almost 1750. So uh, we're still falling short by about uh, $1,000. So if anybody has $1,000, <laughs> just burn an hole in your pocket and you want to give to missions, please feel free. So life, uh, family life, pre not this one. So, uh, so out there in that uh, laundry basket, there's these baby bottles. Uh, these are not just free baby bottles for your babies. But so in it, you put money or a check or coins, no coupons, or cash, right, exactly. Uh, no coupons. Anyway, uh, and we're going to be collecting them on Father's Day. Uh, you can... When you take a bottle, make sure you sign up and let them know how many bottles you may make, more than one. Uh, but please bring them back between now and Father's Day. It doesn't have to be on Father's Day, just between now and then. Oh, did you want to share something else? I just wanted well, to come on. Talk about the baby okay, well, all right. So last year, this is one of their, one of their many fundraisers. Um, last year, she said, for some reason, they did not get hardly any of these bottles back. So guys, if... This, this not only means a life, but when the people choose a life, this helps them with classes. It helps them to provide for their child. So as the person is taking these classes to learn how to be a great parent, um, you're, you're not only saving a life, but you're, you're helping with their, their parents' lives as well. So if you take a bottle, please, please, please bring it back. And if for some reason you can't, just bring back the bottle, okay? Yes, thank you. And by the way, it's got a little slot in it, so you really can't yeah, use it. Yeah. Don't try to do that. All right, so we got birthdays. Olita. Is she here? No, I don't see her. Alan Lee. Alan Lee, are you here? Is everybody else celebrating a birthday that we didn't catch this week? Oh, back there, Maria, who, who, and uh, who? Oh, on the 22nd? Well, how old are you now? <laughs> she's, so, she's trying to hide. I'm sorry, what? Oh. All right, well, we're going to sing you happy birthday for sure. So we want you to come on. No, you don't have to come on. So if, if everybody would go ahead and, and stand with us if you can, and uh, let's honor her and these other guys and sing them happy birthday. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you and many more. All right.
And what about, uh, do we have any uh, anniversaries? Oh, yep. anybody celebrating an anniversary that we didn't know about? All right, well then, while you're standing, let's go ahead and go to the Lord and worship. Right into worship. Good morning, everyone. Glad you're here. And uh, we're, as we all know, uh, if we listen to the TV, we definitely know we're in the end times, um, especially if you've read Revelations. But instead of dreading all that we're hearing, our focus should be going to the Lord, our focus on God. And uh, our first song today is The Days of Elijah. It was not good then, but it's still not good now. <laughs> but it is good for us because we know the Lord. So we'll just, in yeah, I'll do that the next song. Okay, all right. the days of Elijah Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you today and gather to lift you up, to worship you and praise you for the almighty and loving God that you are. Lord, today uh, we sing to you. We, li we lift up these uh, words that describe just how glorious you are, Lord. And uh, we ask you this morning, Lord, to Work in our hearts. Clear our thoughts. Let us be that new life that you have given us. Refine us, Lord. Make us pure as gold that we may glorify you. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where Comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life, I'm in awe of you, I'm in God and 
Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for that amazing love. You love us so much and all the blessings you pour upon us. And I believe the whole Bible tells the story of your amazing love. And so today I ask you to bless this offering as we give it back to you to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, did we get all of them? You got me on? There we go.
How are you this morning? <laughs> come here. Come here, have a seat, Ray. Oh. <laughs> Woo. It's got my eyes, doesn't it? You're right, it is. Good morning. I can't hear you. Good morning. All right. Anybody know what today is? It is Sunday. You're absolutely right. Do you know, do you know what today is, though? I'm sorry? It, it, we are in May. You're right. It is May 19th, 2024. Anybody, anybody know the word Pentecost? Ah, yes, it's Pentecost Sunday. So what is Pentecost Sunday? It's the birth of the church. Yeah, not, not First Baptist Church, but the church. See, First Baptist Church, our, our birthday's in July, but for the church, we, we were born 50 days after Easter. Now, now, does anybody know what Pentecost means? Pentecost means 50. Yes. So it's seven sevens, because it's the week, uh, festival of the weeks. It's seven of them, and then another day. And then you have Pentecost. So what's special about Pentecost? Anybody know? There was this prophet named Joel, and Joel prophesied that after the Messiah would go into heaven, he would send the Holy Spirit down. And on Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit came down. Now, Peter is the one that explained this to them. Is this news to you guys? You already had this figured out? Y'all seem a little somber this morning. So for birthdays, what do we usually do? We sing happy birthday, don't we? So why don't we stand up and let's sing the church a happy birthday? What, what do you say? Yeah. Well, let's sing, the, let's sing it to the church, though. Come on, let's stand up. All right, you're going you're gonna to lead us, right? Okay, start us off. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear church. Happy birthday to you. For eternity. Now, do you realize that? The church is always going to exist. Everything, there's all kinds of things in this world that aren't going to exist anymore, but the church will go on forever. So who wants to pray? Come here. Woo. Do you want to pray? What do we do when we're praying? Everybody stand up. Come on. Dear Lord, thank for this day. Thank for everything you had to give us. Thank for the sons. Thank for rising up, up to the for us. And thank for what everyone's going to learn today. Help everyone drive safe home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, hang on just a second. Hang on just a second. Just a reminder, this is our second week of splitting the team, kid. So the... Fourth through six are going to go down to the fellowship hall, and the first through third are going into the normal team kid room. Uh, let's make sure after service that we go collect our kids. But she was helping me. <laughs> All right, before you sit down, go find somebody and tell them the Lord wants you to. Make good use of your pain.
Oh man, I, I'm not getting a whole lot of participation here. The Lord wants you to make good use of your pain. Everybody just wanting to get right into this message, aren't you? Is, is anybody in here dealing with any pain? Well, let me ask it a different way. Is there anybody here that doesn't have any pain in their life? Ah. So this little series has kind of been broken up a little bit by things that have been going on. We had our deacon doing the speaking. Uh, Joseph Nally gave us focus on Christ. I think it was a great message and it was timely and everything that was going on. Uh, we had Mother's Day, which I, I really, I wasn't going to pass that up. Uh, how many of you actually got to sit into the first two messages, our pain part one and part two? I just got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Are y'all right? If, if you did not get... Uh, the first couple messages. The outlines are on the message board as you go out of the foyer, and I would encourage you to uh, take those outlines and go down through the scripture. We're going to do a little recap right now for it, because uh, it is. It's kind of a, a process. Um, you know, God uses our pain. I been, began in our first message reminding everybody that pain is an inevitable part of our lives. As long as we're here on this broken world, we are going to experience pain. Of course, we, we love revelation, and our hope is that one day there will be no more pain. Uh, but for now, um, pain is not an option, but misery is. You see, you can be in pain and not be in misery. There, there's some choices to be made in life, and, and how you use your pain, how you use the pain that has come into your life is important, because God has an intended purpose for it. A, a lot of people waste their pain. Good morning, son. <laughs> now, you're going to go through pain, so, so why waste it? Why would you want to waste uh, those character-developing opportunities in pain? In the first message, we looked at the way that God uses pain in people's lives. He uses pain for our good. In the second message, I shared some of the choices that you can make so that you can benefit, actually benefit, uh, seek rewards through your pain. Now it's the time for us to realize that it's not about us. And any time you've got pain in your life, it's not just for you. It's for every relationship that you have. And it's a time that you can use it to help others. How can you use pain in your life to help others? I mean, that's really the question that we're looking to answer today. You, you can use painful experiences that you've had for your own benefit. But it's so much more when you can use it to benefit someone else uh, somebody who's shared some of the experiences that you have. How many disciples of Jesus do we have in here? Ah, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if, if you have fallen under His Lordship, you are a disciple of Jesus, and you do as Jesus did. Uh, guess what Jesus did? He suffered for others. He shared His pain with others. You and I sit here today as a benefit of that pain. We, we wouldn't be here this morning if Jesus hadn't suffered for us. Jesus went through enormous suffering and pain, and He didn't do it just for His benefit. He did it for ours. Now, with this in mind, let's take a moment now. I'm, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. You see, Paul instructs us to capture our thoughts. 
So let's take some time right now to allow our minds to clear out for the Word of God. Lord and Heavenly Father, we have so much to say thank you for. And it seems kind of odd to say thank you for our pain. But Lord, we should be grateful for the pain that you bring into our life. As we study your word today, we'll, we'll see the significance of how you can work through pain. How you can change us, how you can draw us close, how you can warn us from the impending doom and change our direction. Father, there are many people this morning that are struggling with pain. But you know the details. You've already gone before us. And Father, I ask that you be with them now. I'll be with those that, that uh, weren't able to make it here this morning. Maybe they're watching online, Lord. And I pray that you might uh, keep that desire for fellowship uh, strong in their heart. Um, Father, guide us now as we open up your word and we try to discern uh, how you would use pain in our life and for the benefit of others. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So God does want you to take advantage of your pain for yourself, but not only for yourself, He wants you to take advantage of your pain for others. Now, now you say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because God's Word says that. That's exactly what God's Word says. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I would invite you to read the entire chapter. We're going to focus in on verse, verses 4 and 6 here. But it says, He comforts us in all of our afflictions. And that's quite a statement, isn't it? He comforts us. You remember Jesus said to the disciple of Christ, those who mourn, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Where do you think that comfort comes from? It comes from God Himself. He says He comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And in verse 6, it says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is experienced in your endurance of the same suffering that we suffer. You see, when you go through something, you are the best witness to somebody else who's already going through it and the healing that you have received from God. So how do you know when you've truly been healed of your pain, of your past experiences and the difficulties uh, that, that life has brought on you? How do you know when you've been healed from past hurts? The answer is this. You begin to use your painful experiences to help other people. In Celebrate Recovery that we're kicking back up on Friday, uh, this is really the 12th step. This is, this is the graduation. This is, this is when you actually know that you have been receiving healing from Jesus Himself. Is when you start helping other people in their hurts. You see, until you can receive the healing and let it flow from you, you really you haven't received it at all. There's no blessing that comes to you that's supposed to remain with you. 
It's supposed to flow through you to other people. The Bible tells us to start thinking about other people. To start putting our focus outside of ourselves to the, to the people that are in pain around us. You see, you're a product of what has happened to you in your life. But you do not have to let it take control of you. You do not have to let everything that has happened to you in life control your future. You can use it to be a better person. Some people let their past make them a bitter person. I want you to be a better person. God wants you to be a better person. You are a product of what has happened in your life, but it should never be what determines your next step. Because God should determine your next step. If you want to help someone, you might start by telling them how your pain has warned you. How it's been a warning light to you. Uh, my, my brother Ron is here today. We worked on the F-22 fighter together. And on the F-22 fighter, when there's a problem, uh, there's this little, little, little bing that comes up. And it starts to tell you things. And you get this little FRC, a fault reporting code. And, and there's things that go on that tell you that, that, that something's out of balance. Something ain't right. Something needs to be fixed. And that's what our pain is. It's a warning light. It's a, it's a fault reporting code. Something ain't right in your life when, 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 you're, when you're going through some pain. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. You see, I've been through a lot, I've had a lot of pleasures in life. But I've learned very little through my pleasures. But the pains in my life, C.S. Lewis says, that's God's megaphone. He is talking to you in your pain. He is yelling at you in your pain. He's trying to get you to change in your pain. He's trying to get your attention. Everybody know the story of Job? Job had it going on, didn't he? And in one day, whoo, it all falls apart. And in Job 36, 15, we read, God rescues the afflicted. By their afflictions. What? <laughs> God rescues those in pain by their pain. He instructs them by their torment. Whew. Hard times and trouble are God's way of warning us. Pain is like an alarm going off. It's God's way of saying to get going and do something about something you need to change in your life. And I know he's talking to you right now. You, you probably, that probably already popped into your head. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do this. You see, we can ignore a lot of things in our life. When, we, when things are good, when, when things are going our way, we can ignore a lot of things. But pain is one of those things that's hard to ignore. I've seen people that are pretty good at it, but they're really tore up on the inside. Is God trying to get you to listen to something right now through your pain? Do you remember the example of the prodigal son that we talked about in the first message? You see, it was his pain that got a hold of him. He's got everything going right in his life. He's got his inheritance. He's off partying. He's having a good time. This world is taking care of him until the paycheck runs out. And then all of a sudden he realizes everything is wrong. And all of a sudden, this Jewish boy is feeding pigs which is extremely low for a Jewish boy to do. And he's longing to eat their food because he, he's got pains of hunger. He's in a foreign land trying to figure out, just how did I get here? What warning signs did I miss? 
You see, it was his pain that turned him around and brought him back to his father. Pain got his attention. Pain often gets our attention. You see, we rarely change until the fear of change is exceeding by pain. You see, when things are going well, eh, there ain't a whole lot of likelihood you're going to listen to what I got to say. You're not going to listen to what God's got to say to you. And he tends to, okay, well, we're going to spank you. We're going to wake you up. Elisha was part of God's plan. I like Elisha. Stop the rain. And he gave Elisha a little oasis, a little brook of cherish. Elisha got comfortable. You ever been comfortable? Uh, I was in bed this morning. I was comfortable. It's been a long couple of days. We had the High Desert Baptist Association golf tournament on Friday. We had the ladies' tea yesterday. Uh, can you imagine somebody cut all the wiring from the control boxes at the golf course? So, so guess what? We, we've, uh, uh, big thank you out to Dwayne. He got half of them already working. <clears throat> but I probably got 12 hours in the last three days of just out there watering. Because when there ain't no control, it don't water. You got to go out and manually do it. 160 acres out there. That gets you out of your comfort zone real quick. And maybe that's what God was doing in this. He was getting us out of our comfort zone. You know what he did to Elijah? He shut the brook off. He said, Elijah, I got work for you to do, and you're too comfortable. Get up. Move. Go where I'm telling you to go. Do what I'm telling you to do. This reminds us that God uses pain to move us into His action. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, Now I rejoice. Why is Paul rejoicing to the church at Corinth? Because you were grieved. Ah, I'm happy about your pain. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? But because you were grieved, it led to repentance. It turned you to the Lord. I am so happy that people in here are, are feeling some pain. Because that means the Lord's working in your life. He says, for you were grieved as God willed. So that you didn't experience any loss from us. You didn't turn away from God's family. You were turned back to God's family. Just as the prodigal son has been turned back to God's family. One way we show that God uses pain as an indicator to us. Is that we become real about it. We become true about it. it. It becomes a reflection of our life. You see, when you're in pain, you shouldn't try to pretend. I, I, we're pretty good at liars uh, as Christians because we, we've kind of programmed ourselves. Hey, how's it going? I'm blessed. How's it going? I am extremely blessed and highly favored. How's it going? Very rare are we honest. Like, man, I'm hurting. My, my fingers don't want to work. My knees are hurting. My back's out. I got a headache. Yeah. <clears throat> you see, now that's reality. And, and the truth is, when we can be authentic in our pain, oh, man, we can be a witness in somebody's life. 2 Corinthians 6, 11, we have spoken openly to you, Paul says. Corinthians, our hearts have been opened wide. Now, now, Paul had a nice, easy, relaxed life in his ministry, didn't he? Didn't have much going on, just kind of preached every Sunday. and, and, and uh, No, that wasn't Paul at all, was it? 
there wasn't no grass growing underneath Paul's feet. As a matter of fact, his feet were always dirty. He was always on the move. People respond to you when they know that you're real. This is also a reflection of what else you need, which is humility. You see, if you want to be real and you want to be humble, then you can be a strong witness. None of us are perfect. The first thing in uh, CR is to recognize that our lives are unmanageable, that we need God, that we need Jesus in our lives. It's really Matthew 5, 3. It's what I spoke about to the kids on Thursday at, the, at Young Life in the high school. People respond when they know you're real. You see, I, I gave a little message on that, and, and then we had a little opportunity for some questions. And then there was one young man there that he asked me, well, why did you want to become a pastor? And I had to get real with him. I didn't want to be a pastor. It was never one of my plans. It was God's plan. You, you see, I, I was going to be a professional golfer. I was going to run around this world. I was going to, I, I, I'd have been in Valhalla this week. <laughs> no, I'm too old now. I'd have been dumb by now. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the truth is, uh, that's a golf course in, 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 in uh, Kentucky, yeah. <laughs> um, I told my mama I'm never getting married. <laughs> said, said the earliest I'd get married was when I was 40. Now, you ever told God that you ain't going to do something? I, I think it was the next year that I was getting married to my wife, Lita. <laughs> he has a way of working through things, doesn't he? And, and when you're real, people know it. You see, shortly after that, my mother passed away. Now, I knew Christ, but he was not in my plans. Now, I knew Jesus was Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but I had my own kingdom to build. And it wasn't until the pain of my mother passing that God started to orchestrate why I'm standing here talking to you this morning. God's got a way of working things out. God's got a way of dealing with you. Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcised nor uncircumcised accomplishes anything. It doesn't matter what you do in life. What matters is faith working through love. You, you can try to be as religious as you want to be, uh, could be, and so on and so forth. That, that ain't going to do you nothing. You need to have faith in who God is and His love for you to truly be an impact in this world. None of us is perfect. Have you figured that out? You see, this church was perfect until we came in. Uh, then it became the imperfect church because people are there. If you're looking for the perfect church, you ain't going to find it because the minute you walk in, it ain't perfect no more. If you know that you're not perfect, why do we pretend that we are? Why do Christians pretend they are perfect already? Why do we look down our nose at other people? There ain't nobody that we're better than. The only thing we got going on for us is the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to be humble about our faults. That way people can actually feel and, and, be, and find the same healing that we have in our pains. If I'm going to be real with others, I have to be willing to accept and admit my failures. And that's what it means to be authentic, to be true. In 1 Timothy 1.15 it says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That's quite a start right there, isn't it? Christ Jesus came into the world 
to save sinners. And I am the worst of them. That's quite a statement right there. That's humility. We must be honest about our frustrations. People relate to being frustrated. Romans 7, 18, Paul says, For I know that nothing good lives in me. Woo, there's a start. That is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. Do you realize that you are in a battle for your very soul? That, that Satan is trying to snatch you away. And he's going to use every evil desire in your heart to do so. Says, I keep doing the evil I don't want to do. Have you ever said anything like that to anybody? I messed up. You, you know what? I want to do the right thing, but I don't. And I don't want to do the wrong thing, but I do. You see, that's being honest. Paul's being honest with us. That's why people listen to Paul, because he, he had a gut uh, approach. He was real with people. 2 Corinthians 12, 20, For I fear, Paul has fears? The apostle Paul has fears? For I fear that perhaps when I come, I will not find you to be what I want. Uh-oh. And I may not be found by you to be what you want. There may be quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Thank God that's not our church. Or is it? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? You, you see, when we can get down to reality, that we aren't perfect, that we got problems, then, then we can come in here truly ready to worship the one who is perfect and wants to perfect us, who is, in fact, in the process of sanctifying us, turning us into the perfection that he will spend eternity with. Paul says, I do admit I have fears. Have you admitted your fears to anybody? He says, have you ever been honest with anybody, especially in the church? These are the things that are in my life. These are the problems that I have. These are the imperfections of me. We all know we've got them. We do a good job of hiding them. Why can't we share them? Why can't we be honest in our pains and our struggles? You see, once we've shown them that pain was a warning sign to us and it, and it moved us in a different direction, that it pointed us to what God wanted in our lives, then I can start to share what I've learned by my pain. You, you see, if they don't believe in you in the first place, that, that you're real, they don't want to hear what you've got to say. Again, Job 36, 15, God rescues the afflicted by their afflictions, the pain by the pain. He instructs them by their torment. How God used stress in my life has opened my eyes to something that was out of whack. Anybody got anything out of whack? Can you say whack in the church? I, I, got, I, got, some, I got some things in my life that are out of whack. What's God trying to open your eyes to? What's out of whack in your life? Proverbs 20, 30. Lashes and wounds purge away evil, and beatings cleanse the innermost parts. You see, God wants to use this pain to transform you. Sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. You see, it's wise to learn from our experiences. Everybody in here has had experiences, right? But let me tell you what's wiser. It's, it's wiser to learn from the experiences of others so that you don't have to go through those pains and difficulties that others have already gone to before you and, and have witnessed to you about. We can learn from each other's mistakes. It's a lot easier to learn from somebody else's mistake than it is from our own. The pain is so much less. See, there's three things that God wants you to learn from pain. 
the first one, probably the most important, is God wants you to depend more on Him in your pain. You know, I, I gave you the example with, uh, with Raiden and, and Mom. You know, when Raiden gets hurt, it's, Mom, help me. Kiss it, make it better. We should be saying, God, help me kiss it and make it better. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed. Paul and them's having a tough time here in Asia. Beyond our strength, it's more than we could handle. So that we even despaired of life. We thought we were dead. Actually, we had a death sentence in this. Indeed, we personally had a death sentence within ourselves. So that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Hmm. See, the truth of the matter is, is you don't know that you need God until God is all that you have. As long as you can find something else to turn to, you're probably going to keep turning to it. There's so many people that want God's stuff, but don't really want God, the author and perfecter. A second thing that we need to do that would, let, let me tell you right now, you want less pain in your life, you need to spend more time in God's Word. Most of our pain comes because God can't uh, teach us through His Word, because this is how the book remains, closed. You see, if you're not in here studying, not, not just reading, but, but looking for, for Jesus in all of this, and, and what He intends for you as His disciple to live like, well, God's got to find another way to move you. He's got to find another way to get you going. To, to, to get you back in alignment, to take care of what's out of whack. And we know that is pain. Yes, is. Psalms 119, 67, David. I, don't y'all love David? Man after God's own heart. And, and this man after God's own heart had a few problems in his life. He, he made a few missteps in life. And, and, and so what happens when you make a misstep? Verse 67 in Psalms 119, before I was afflicted, before you brought the pain down on me, I went astray. I was doing my own thing. But now, I keep your word. Ah, you don't have to tell me again. You ain't, ain't got to spank me the same way. I'm, I'm a learning fella right now. I'm going to keep your word because I don't want that again. Life is a school and problems are the curriculum. Some lessons we only learn through failure and mistakes. Don't be that person. Learn through God's Word. Psalms 119, a few verses down, 71. It was good for me to be afflicted. David is happy about getting that pain coming his way. So that I could learn your statutes. You see, I was stubborn. I was stiff-necked. I was doing my own thing until you afflicted me. Uh, now I learn in a different way. I want to know everything that you want so that I can be right with you. David admits he learned to trust God and obey God's Word. It, it taught him to pay attention to his loss, and he lost a bunch. Another thing that's very important, especially here at Pentecost, day of the church, is that we need to learn that we need each other. You see, we weren't meant to go through this uh, as an orphan Christian. 
we're supposed to be disciples in unity, working together in one thought, one process, moving forward with our focus on Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. You, you see, you're not supposed to do this by yourself. You're supposed to bring others along with you, and, and we're supposed to witness to each other. Fellowship is so much more than, than having a meal once in a while. It's actually living life together. It's, it's letting somebody know that you got hurts and pains and struggles and allowing them to be a part of the solution. When I'm in pain, you help me. You pray for me. I, I feel your prayers. And when you're in pain, guess what I'm doing? I'm praying for you. The beauty of other people being in your life is a lot of times those are what God will use to reveal to you, will show you yourself in the mirror. They'll show you what's out of whack in your life because you'll see it in somebody else's life. And when you see that, then you can respond to it. When you're in pain... You should be asking, what do you want me to learn in this, Lord? And, and when you're open and honest with other people, sometimes they will show you. They'll, they'll show you those blind spots that you have in your life, the things that you aren't paying attention to, the things that God is wanting you to see. Philippians 1.12 says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advance of the gospel. What's going on with Paul at this time? He's in prison. He's not just in prison. He's in this dungeon. He's in chains, chained to a 24-hour guard. And what does he say? What has happened to me, he's pretty kind of nonchalant about it, has actually advanced the gospel. There were actually people in Nero's house that we're coming to salvation. Now, do you think God wants your life to be easy? I, I mean, really, uh, you know, I, 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 it's, it's a nice concept, right? But it's not true. Paul's in prison, and he, he's saying that God is using this. Now, this entire year, we keep referring to this verse. It's posted in the foyer. It's Romans 8, 28. Now, you know, there's, it's important because as a disciple of Christ, there's things that we need to have in our mind. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Allow the Spirit to change the way you think. You know, because most people, when pain and, and circumstances and afflictions come your way, it, it becomes a time of, oh, I'm going to cower away from this, I'm going to hide, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to do that, uh, I'm going to turn to this, I'm going to turn to that. But it says right here in Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things, now that's pretty encompassing, isn't it? All things includes everything. But it says it works together for the good of those who love God those who are called according to His purpose. It doesn't say, I, I, I don't want you to read this into it, because it doesn't say that we know that everything that happens in life has a happy ending. It doesn't. Newsflash. There's some struggles out there for all of us to have. What it does say is that we know. We know that God's working in these things. We don't hope, we don't wish, we don't imagine, we don't desire. We know that He is working in these things. There's a grand design by God Almighty, the scheme in behind everything. Our lives are not the result of fate. We're not lucky. You are not an accident. It says in all things God is working. Every mistake, failure, bankruptcy, disease, divorce, death, miscarriage, it, it all fits into His plan. God weaves both our mistakes and our hurts into His plan. He uses both our sin and our suffering in His plan. 
Would you be willing to be honest and talk about your sin and suffering to someone else who's going through the same thing that you have gone through? You see, God can use that in the lives of other people. God knew it was going to happen to you even before it happened. So he developed this plan in advance that he would bring people along your path that would have similar circumstances and you would be able to witness to them. This is how God can use the pain in your life to help other people. Wouldn't that be beneficial? Wouldn't you like to be able to help somebody to keep from having to go through the same pains and struggles that you have? Or, or, or be able to be comforted in that? Y- y- y'all remember Joseph, right? Jo- Joseph had it going on, didn't he? The first 40 years of his life was miserable. <laughs> Yet that's why I tell you to have a blessed day. Because it says God was with him. His brothers sell him off into slavery. You know, some good brothers right there. But they didn't realize that they were doing God's plan. He, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. And then accuses him of rape. And he goes to prison for it. And then this man was pure. And then the day comes. Where, where this all started. Comes full circle. And his brother's are before him. And this is what he says to him in Genesis 50, 20. You planned evil against me. Ah, ain't no, ain't no candy coating that, is it? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring a, about the present result, the survival of many people. And he, was, he, he had forgiveness in his heart already. Now, now, you may be hard against somebody right now. Saying, ah, uh-uh, they ain't getting my forgiveness. But you better look real close at how God is working in your life through the pain that they've caused you. Because you may not be sitting here right now listening to His Word if they hadn't done that. You see, additionally, I need to share how Jesus gave me hope in my pain. This is what Joseph is doing with his brothers. God has given me hope. You need to be a hope dispenser. You seen, you seen our hand sanitizer dispensers out here? People need to be come up and hit you in the head and, and, and push out a whole bunch of hope into their hands and, and, and bathe in it. You need to be a hope dispenser. Again, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. For we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed. It was too much for us to handle beyond our strength so that even despaired in life. Indeed, we personally had a death sentence in our lives so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raised the dead. I, I just thought I was going to die, Paul said. But I put my hope in God. People say I feel hopeless, and that's true. Outside of a relationship with God, you're going to feel a whole lot of hopeless. Because there's nothing going for you. Sometimes life just kicks the hope out of you. We all need hope to cope. One of the best places to get hope besides God himself is from other people who have been there before you. You need other people in your life. You need to be willing to share your life with others. It's called fellowship. But I want you to know God has a promise for you. Pay pay attention. God has a promise for you. Anybody want one of God's promises? Let me ask, how many promises has God broke? He's perfect, didn't he? Yeah. He got no mistakes, failures, uh, any flaws. And yet in Psalms 91.15, God says, When he calls out to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. 
I don't know about you, I like that promise. Because I need to be rescued. Every single day of my life. God says, I will answer you. Talk to me. Pray to me. I will be with you in all your pains and struggles and every trouble of your life. He didn't say I would deliver you out of it, but I will deliver you through it. I will save you and I will honor you. I don't know what's discouraging you right now. Where your depression might be coming from. Where the confusion and the pain is. And I don't know what mess you're in. But I can tell you God never said that life was going to be easy. He never said that you won't have any problems. In fact, just the opposite. He said, this is a broken world. You're in a battle. Uh, suck it up, buttercup. we got some work to do. And he said, I'm going to be with you in the midst of all of it. You see, you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. He's already won. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Let me get the worship team to come on up. I tell you, this is a proportion thing. The bigger God gets in your life, the smaller your problems get. And the smaller God is in your life, the bigger your problems get. When we draw close to God, it brings greater hope inside of us. You see, the people around you might applaud you for your successes. They might say, well done. But it's truly your mistakes and your failures and them seeing you as a real person that will draw them to you. Not to you, but to the God who is working through you. Let's stand up. So I don't want you to waste your pain. Of course, let me preface that. If you have not submitted to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and I, I, I like this reality check. When people tell me they've made Jesus their Lord, it's a lie. God made Jesus your Lord. But when you've submitted yourself to Jesus and His Lordship, All the pain in your life, all the struggles, all the difficulties will start to funnel you right back to Him. And it's not just you. You see, every relationship that you have is affected by your relationship with Jesus Christ. The bigger He gets in your life, the bigger He gets in their life. But if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're wasting your pain. You're wasting your days. And you're on a path to destruction. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but it's the truth. You have an opportunity right now. Tomorrow's not promised. The next moment's not promised. Jesus may come back, snatch us up right now. But you have an opportunity to get right with God. 
And it's not just simply saying a prayer. It's actually believing in your heart that Jesus is the King of kings, Lord of lords, and that he has paid your debt. And asking his forgiveness and receiving that free gift from him. Father, I want to come to you and I lift up all my brothers and sisters. I thank you for your word. I pray that it moves us, it motivates us, it changes us, Lord, uh, so that we can truly uh, use these pains and difficulties, these afflictions to bring others to you and to the kingdom, Lord. If there's somebody here this morning who has not submitted to your lordship, Lord, I, I pray that right now as we have, Lord, we ask that, that you would forgive them of their sins, Lord, and that they, they will accept you as their Lord and that, they, that you will take them by the hand and guide them through this broken world. Father, help them to come to the reality that they need to confess their sins, and we know that you are faithful and just when they do uh, to forgive their sins. Not just forgive them, but to completely wipe them away, to make them completely 100% under your blood, Jesus Christ's blood, to be okay, to be able to go into the presence of God to spend eternity in heaven with us. If that's you this morning, Please don't leave here without coming and talking to me. we got some work to do out there, brothers and sisters. Father, I ask that you guide us, bring people into our paths, help us to share uh, the reality of our life, that, that we were broken, lost sinners, and, and now we have you, and we're, we're still uh, struggling and finding difficulties in this world but we have our hope and it is secured in in what your son has done for us help us to share that it's our responsibility to you Lord so that you can do your salvation work in their lives guide us as we go into our mission field and we ask it all in Jesus name and everyone said
Have a blessed week.